Hello, everyone. This is Florence Champagne with the Open My Heart Foundation. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a very, very important topic that we're going to discuss. Uh, but just to let you know a little bit about myself and the organization, my name is Florence Champagne, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Open My Heart Foundation. And what we have once a month um, is support groups called SOS, Supporting Our Sisters. So that's what we're here for tonight. Uh, and, and our hope is to educate people, give them something else to think about that they may not have thought about in reference to COVID-19 and how it has impacted all of us. And to discuss the fact that everything is opening right now. Are we out of the woods yet? So uh, that's an important question. We have doctors on board. We have testimonials from people uh, to share with you today. So I thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. If you have a question, please go ahead and type it in the chat box and I'll be checking uh, from Facebook Live, I'll be checking the chat box periodically. So, uh, We've got the Delta variant out there now. We're going to talk about that. Um, and, you know, schools are open. Some schools are shutting down again. Uh, restaurants, bars, gyms. You know, you would think that everything is okay now. So, you know, we're going to talk about that. And, and one of the things uh, I'd like to start off with is the fact that COVID has impacted all of us in some way. Everyday people, uh, COVID is impacting our lives. Real, real people, people that we know that have had COVID. Uh, some of us have had COVID and we have had some losses due to COVID. So this is, this is an important subject and uh, we are so honored to have one of our guests with us tonight, uh, who is my sister, Jackie Mims, and she's going to go up first. I'm so honored and blessed uh, that she agreed to share her story. Uh, Jackie uh, suffered a, a real traumatic loss in her family, her mother, the matriarch of her family. So to share her story tonight, we're going to get started um, and just have, have Jackie tell us a little bit about her mother, what she was like, uh, and the impact that she's had, uh, her loss has had on her family's lives. So without any further ado, we're going to get started with this Jackie Mims. Jackie? Hi, Florence. Can you hear me? There we go. Hi, Jackie. Okay. Hi, so let me, see. let me see if I can highlight you. There you go. Hi, Jackie. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate you, Florence, and I love you, and uh, I thank God for you. And um, it was just a conversation that you and I had uh, just last week, and um, many have asked me to share, and I just had a conversation with you, and it was a warm conversation. I thought maybe it was time but just to share yes, yes. a little bit um, about my mom, wonderful woman of God. Um, my mom was affectionately known as Nana. That's what we call my mom, Nana. Um, my mom loved the Lord and definitely called according to his purpose. Um, we lost dad 36 years ago. So I was a teenager. So my mom opted to never marry again, 
but to marry herself to the Lord and to focus on her family. I'm one of 14 and I am the baby. So I just wanted to share with you what happened to my family when we suffered the loss of my mom due to COVID. Um, it was just, my mom went to get her infusions. Her, you know, she's anemic, so she went to her appointment and they really, really felt like my mom's um, oxygen levels were low. So because of that, um, they wanted to take her over to the ER. And taking my mom to the ER, they suggested that they would admit her and um, keep her overnight. And then we spoke with the nurses in the morning. And the nurses in the morning did share with us that my mom needed 100% oxygen and they would recommend her getting on um, they would recommend that she should be intubated so we said okay and not knowing mom was intubated and that was um, in April actually at the end of March and on April 6th my mom passed away. So it was eight days in the hospital. Um, and that was just it for us. But more importantly, um, my mom, I spoke with the doctor on that Sunday and she struggled during that weekend. And um, not to mention, I did have a family friend Rick Black, who's a registered nurse of 30 years, and my sister Vanessa. We kept tabs on my mom so many times a day. And um, the last time we were able to see her, because they do set up uh, a little video conference, if you will, and we got a chance to see her. And um, then the next day, we spoke with the doctor. And I said, well, how was her weekend? They said it was tough, she was struggling, but I'm thinking, okay, struggling. And then she said, um, I think you need to um, prepare your family to say goodbye to her. And I'm like, goodbye? I just spoke with her last Friday. She's like, yeah, she's, uh, she's struggling and it's not really much more we can do. So our world has been shattered, flipped upside down, and I cannot tell you the pain that we are feeling daily. And we had two options. It was either the ground or the crematorium. That Those were the options. We asked, can we see her? No, we wrapped her twice when she gets to... Um, the next location, she'll be wrapped again twice, but you can't see her. And there'll be no autopsies because it's COVID. So that was difficult for my family. So right now, my family and I struggle every single day. And mainly holidays because we're a big family and we love one another. And my mom always sits at the head of the table. So we do have an empty seat in the house. My mom is no longer there. And I can't tell you how crushed my heart is. I can't tell you how crushed my family is, but we're just crushed trying to make sense of this. And as it stands right now, we can't make sense of it. So part of me is very, very angry. And part of me is broken, like in a million pieces. Um, my mom was my best friend. I was the baby girl, so we know how it is with babies. Um, uh, it's so much more, but for the sake of me keeping myself together, um, that is all I can share without breaking down because of where we are right now, uh, we're hurting really bad. We're hurting and it just feels like, you know, we're just, I don't know. We're just on an island by ourselves. And honestly, I've just been,
You did a great job. I've been Jackie. waiting for her to come home. Jackie, you did a great job. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and I Thank certainly you. will respect um, your, your limited time of, of sharing what you can, um, as difficult as it may be. Um, Thank you. I, at this point, I'd like to uh, ask any of the panelists if they have any words for Jackie. We know that um, this was a traumatic loss in her family. Um, it's not easy. Um, any any closing words or thoughts? I, I appreciate you so much, Jackie, being on here. I do know that Jackie um, needs to leave a little bit early so she would but um, I'd like to ask the panelists does anyone have any any words or thoughts for Jackie can you see me Jackie yes I can see you this is uh I know you remember Terry and Rick Peters from the health fair hi yes hi. I do and I am so sad to hear about what happened to your mom and I just want to just encourage you because you you were such a bright spirit in our whole health fair when we did it. And to, to see you suffering right now, and I've seen working in an all COVID hospital at University of Maryland in Laurel, your story hits home because you're speaking from the other side. I see it from the inside and, and saw what your mother probably went through when she was in the hospital. So my heart really goes out to you. And I definitely would like to keep you and your family and our prayers. You remember my husband, Rick? Rick yes, too. hi. Oh, yeah. So we really, um, you know, grieve when you have to grieve. You're allowed to grieve. And mm -hmm. if you feel like crying, you cry. Just let it out. Just don't hold it in. Feel free to just feel that because you loved your mom. You were close to your mom. Mm -hmm. And hold on to those memories of the good times that you had with your mom to get through this. Thank you. I like to say um, <clears> that, of course, there's no words that can be expressed uh, by anyone at any time to take away that pain. I know I've been through it. Uh, I had a, 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 a triple from year to year to year. And uh, so I, I'm still grieving even seven years later. But the power in it is that you allow yourself the, the freedom and the glory to uh, to bereave and take it take that in and as you come out of it you want to take all that feeling and put it into the memories and the strength that you know that those family members that you're missing or the family member that you're missing uh, gave to you and believed in you and, and you take in that spiritual part that you know that they're still with you spiritually and they're still watching over you spiritually. And they, they want you to miss them. They also want you to carry on, um, not just for yourself, but for your family and who they created you to be. They were proud of you. She was proud of you before she left and she's gonna be even more proud of you now because she's watching everything you're doing so there are times when i still seven years later i just may be driving down the street and i'll see something or hear mm -hmm. something you know a song my mom was a church mom a song i'll see a lady with a church hat look like mm -hmm. my mom you know <laughs> you know somebody yeah. coming to the pharmacy i'm like oh god it look like my mom and yeah. you know, it just may bring that tear up i just go to the bathroom go in the back room i i, I take my tears i enjoy those tears and i come back and and say that was just just, just her visiting me, you know, at the time, making sure that I'm still uh, doing what she wanted me to do. And I know mm -hmm. your mother will want that from you, who wants you to Absolutely. continue doing what she put in you as the wonderful woman you are today. Thank you so much. Hi, may, may I make a comment as well? Yeah. Hi, Jackie. I'm Dr. Hi. Um, this just, you know, gives credence to the fact that these patients aren't just statistics during this pandemic. Um, 
there are real lives and real families who are hurting immensely. And as physicians, we're t we were taught to have detached concern, but uh, COVID has changed all of that. I think everybody's been impacted <clears throat> some way or other. So I feel your pain. I feel your, the grief you're going through and it's okay. Just know that I myself had added you to my prayer list and yeah. And I think everybody on here feels the same way. And um, I'm sorry for your loss and my condolences to you and your family. Thank you so much. Thank you. Florence, I think you're on mute. Okay, yes. Thank you, Jack. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing once again. Love you, go, and you know that you are in my heart and in my prayers. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Nickens, uh, as I said at the at the onset, uh, everything is opening back up. You know, schools, gyms, uh, entertainment venues. Is it safe out there? Are we out of the woods? Um, you know, you would think everything is okay. And, and you know, then we hear the Delta variant, which uh, is more contagious than COVID-19. What does all of this mean in, in, in light of the fact that everything is opening back up? Or is it safe out there? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Florence. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. 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 Right. Well, uh, so of, it's a privilege to address the group, and I hope I can provide some clarity about the current status of the pandemic and answer, and mostly I'm here to answer questions. Uh, first, I must um, have such respect and gratitude uh, for hearing, you know, for the sharing of a really um, terrible loss but it puts the human cost of this pandemic in front of us. Um, so I have a Nana and I can't imagine, um, you know, um, my, my Nana was my grandmother um, and she was 98 when she passed. Um, and uh, the isolation associated with this disease um, that, uh, you know, the, the uh, person is hospitalized they have difficulty, but for safety, um, they're isolated. Um, so it's really very trying, very stressful. And uh, sharing that story, I hope, makes everyone pause when they think that, that this is not um, simply a flu or um, you know a bad cold, that uh, the consequences of becoming infected are, are quite severe and um, can, as, as uh, unfortunate uh, does happen, leads to death. So I'm sure everyone knows that this pandemic is the result of a coronavirus um, called COVID-19, and it's a worldwide contagion, and it's spread by aerosolized viral particles. So we know masking has been an inexpensive and useful public health measure to impede transmission. It's not perfect, but it is a barrier to the aerosolized virus that is um, contaminates a room, any closed space, or if you're too close even outside to someone who's infected. Um, vaccines specifically, we have an mRNA um, approach, both Pfizer and Moderna, two dose vaccines, as well as a more traditional vaccine, the Janssen's J&J &J single dose. Uh, these vaccines were developed and um, really have proven extremely efficacious in reducing the spread of infection and dramatically reducing hospitalizations and death from COVID-19. Now, um, unfortunately, the higher number of infections, in, in other words, the, the concentration of the infection that's around us and the length of time that we have very high concentration of disease that contributes to the virus's ability to mutate. And in mutation, that can change the ability of the virus 
um, to make the virus more invasive, more contagious, if you will, cause more damage, be even more lethal. And, and, um, and the dreaded mutation is, is that it mutates to something that resists the vaccines that we have in place. So the Delta variant has proven to be more highly contagious than the previous strain of um, coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, that, um, that uh, was the initial two um, surges of the pandemic in this country. Um, and the uh, Delta variant now is largely responsible for the new infections and the current surge in some places. The effect of the Delta variant is that hospitalizations have, uh, which have increased in certain areas, um, Maryland, you know, our metropolitan tri-state area is actually, um, there's some rise, but it's well below any peak levels. But um, as we know, in some places, their hospitalization and death rates have really soared. Um, and, but importantly, the hospitalizations have changed that the pe persons hospitalized are no longer just elderly vulnerable um, uh, patients that are vulnerable because of comorbid disease, but rather they're younger, healthy persons, including children. Um, but fortunately, the vaccines, all of them, Pfizer, Moderna, and Jans and the J&J &J single dose vaccines remain effective in reducing hospitalizations and severe illness. So some 101 about the virus. The virus needs a host to, sur to survive. So again, masks slow the spread. Social distancing or avoid avoiding exposure is an effective way to contain the virus. The virus can be transmitted before or irrespective of the host having symptoms. So one of the things that makes this virus so difficult to get under control is that you can have the disease and transmit the disease to someone else, even though you're, you yourself may not even be aware that you are carrying the virus. Um, fortunately, vaccines are effective, but at this time, vaccines are recommended only for persons 12 years or older. So vaccines for children five to 12 are under evaluation and they're not available now, but the good news is that they may become available as early as the fall. And when that happens, that represents an important game changer for how we're able, you know, our confidence in being able to get on top of this pandemic. So, you know, protecting our children, of course, is a high priority. And return to the classroom is also a high priority. Um, so can we do that? So again, children between five and 12, these are school-age children, there, there is no uh, vaccine. So they must rely on the, um, um, the physical barriers to minimize exposure. So fortunately, a sensible approach that's outlined by CDC guidelines makes it safe for children to attend school. The schools must have proper precautions, including adequate vent ventilation systems at the schools, required masking, social distancing, at least three feet. And very important is that anyone who is, has symptoms suggesting that they might have an, an infection or ill, they must stay at home and isolate and test to see if they have coronavirus. And if they do, that isolation as prescribed is at least 14 days until they clear the virus. But um, by practicing these barrier methods, it actually is safe for children to return to school. And we have Israel as an example and the United Kingdom as um, examples that it can be done and the kids can learn and enjoy, um, not normal because there's masking there and, and obviously the pandemic is still a concern but it is a return to classroom learning. And it's very important for our children. It's important for the parents, for the families. It's, it's a, a return to normal. Um, I should also mention that ideally, adults who come into contact with children should be vaccinated. Um, most of the school systems are requiring their, that the teachers be vaccinated unless there is some um, medical reason. Or, or religious reason that prevents uh, vaccination, but those those um, you know individuals really shouldn't. Um, they they are have the risk of exposing children 
to um, a disease for which um, it can be severe and um, they cannot be protected by vaccination. So I think this is perhaps a good time to stop and answer questions. Um, uh, I'm pleased to do so if anyone um, would like to comment or has a um, concern about their child or um, how, you know, what are their options. Okay. Uh Thank you, Dr. Nickens, and I, I failed to uh, let everyone know that uh, Dr. Nickens is um, from NIH, the National Institute of Health, and the, the director of the, uh, I hope I say this right, Heart and Lung and Blood. Is, is that correct, Dr. Nickens? Well, I'm sorry, I'm not the director. Okay. Institute, but I am a medical officer in that institute. Um, my okay. my uh, director is uh, Gary Gibbons, but uh, Anthony Fauci is the director of another institute, NIAID, and I happen to be part of a um, large trial uh, involved with NIAID. But Dr. Fauci, who ever, I think everyone has heard speak about the, the virus, is um, my um, my director's counterpart in the NIEID. That's the institute that is um, uh, directly uh, um, charged with fighting the infection aspect. But the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute has also been very involved in uh, developing um, ways to monitor some of the um, 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 complications of the disease, as well as using a clinical trial network. We have something that's called Active Four. And um, it's really a tremendous effort that has organized um, uh, recruiting centers or, uh, across the country that has allowed rapid evaluation of pos possible treatments and uh, dismissing treatments that are, th that are thought that might be effective and, um, you know, uh, you know uh, but a, a tremendous effort on the NIH. All personnel like myself are very involved in trying to identify treatments and therapies. But again, I wanted to underscore here the uh, return to school and the information that I think parents should you know, want to know and want to feel comfortable that their children are safe. Thank you again, Dr. Nickens. We do have a question. Uh, Kathy Mohammed asked the question of uh, so many people are wearing masks outside. Is it necessary when you're outside to wear your mask? Uh, yes, thanks for the question. And I, I can't say enough, you know, there's so much um, difference in how people react to something that it's confusing. Um, and uh, so I hope to give you the most conservative perspective and to help um, not make this a right or wrong thing. Um, but um, so um, the idea of wearing a mask is to cover your nose and your mouth where the moist, moist droplets that become aerosolized when you breathe and speak or cough, um, in that spray, if you will, if you are infected, you contain virus, okay? You, you have virus and that can uh, flow. So if you're outside and you're talking to someone, even if, uh, so, you know, if you're talking to someone, you're exposed to that risk, okay? Um, and um, the idea is that if you're outside and you're keeping some reasonable distance, um, people don't throw that um, spray, you know, talking or coughing in such a way that it's a high risk. It's, it's not zero, but as long as you are at least three and the recommendation is six feet away from someone, um, then you don't, you know, then wearing a mask is probably not changing your risk of infection, even if someone out there has, you know, has the, the, um, the disease. However, as we know, um, you know, when you're out and about, um, you may run into someone that you know. Um, it doesn't, or, or someone, you know, a, a child falls on their bicycle or something. And there, there are a lot of things that happen that spontaneously you may find yourself compromised. And so some people just feel more comfortable that they don't have to think about it. They're just wearing their mask. They become very comfortable and feel um, more confident by wearing a mask. 
So while the mask can be a, um, a protection for the individual, it also protects the person that they would encounter. So there's a primary protection, but there's also a consideration to the people around you for wearing a mask. But um, again, wearing masks outside, if you're able to properly distance, um, you know, the mask is not um, a substantial additional barrier to transmitting the disease, but no one should feel offended by someone who feels more comfortable wearing a mask. Um, and, um, you know, and, and on the other hand, so people that wear masks, as long as you keep that distance from other people, you shouldn't feel that um, people not wearing a mask are a threat to you when they're, you know, six or more feet away. Um, and I, so, uh, I just wanted to make a couple comments about what I think has, has been on some confusion and others have pointed to saying, oh, they were wrong or they made mistakes or they were misleading, et cetera. But please understand this pandemic, um, and I was trying to get across this idea that the virus is a live structure and it wants to live. So it has the ability itself to change in what we call mutation. Um, so things that we know about the virus, as we learn, we have to adjust to what we, you know, what we thought we knew yesterday. We may have new information or better information that allows us to protect ourselves. And so, what is new is, um, you know, originally once once properly vaccinated, two doses for the mRNA Moderna Pfizer vaccine and one for the J Johnson vaccine, um, that you have a fairly high protection against getting infected and therefore a mask may not be necessary. But the Delta variant has proven to be more contagious than the original virus. So again, if you catch the virus and, you're in, and you've been vaccinated, the likelihood of you getting severe uh, infection is low. But especially since you've been vaccinated, you, if you're exposed, you can carry that virus and not have symptoms or have very mild symptoms. So the return to wearing masks, even if you are doubly vaccinated, has to do with understanding that the Delta variant, which is out there now, it's here in Maryland. It's in, um, it's, it's really, it's North America, North and South America. It's quite prevalent now. Um, because of the Delta virus, even if you are um, completely vaccinated, two doses or single dose J Johnson & Johnson, there's a possibility that you can have an infection, low-level infection, not be sick, and that you um, uh, would transmit to someone else who perhaps you know, uh, thinks they do, you know, people are not wearing a mask because they don't think that they're at risk. They're not, you know, they're indoors. They think they have enough space from you, or they know that you're vaccinated, and they say, "Well, since you're vaccinated, you're not carrying the virus, etc." So again, it's um, just upping as we learn information, trying to be as safe as possible. Um, the lucky thing for patients that are vaccinated is that the likelihood of them becoming severely ill is really reduced. Um, five, sevenfold by having the, the vaccination. But it does not, with the Delta virus, it does not prevent you from becoming infect, uh, being infectious to other people. Thank you, Dr. Nickens. One more part to uh, Kathy's question was, she wants to know why are those who have had the vaccine getting reinfected? Yes. Uh, so again, um, so the, the way these um, and, um, a, a, um, vaccination works is that it's not an all or none. It means that when, if you're exposed to the virus, your body has an immune system that has been trained through the vaccinations to recognize the invaded, this in, the coronavirus specifically, and it um, eradicates the virus quickly. Um, and uh, the um, ability of the Delta virus to invade is so uh, um, rapid that there is a short, there is a period of time that you may be, um, you know, your, nat your immunity that has been boosted by the vaccination, um, it, it will prevent you from becoming ill, but it, 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 um, the uh, Delta variant is high enough that it's possible that you transmit. So yes, um, so 
you know, if you if you have been infected by coronavirus, you can be reinfected. And and for you know to understand that it's like getting a cold. And the fact that coronavirus is much like a cold virus. But if you, um, uh, you know, some people go an entire season and never have a cold, but others get um, colds once, twice, three times, um, varying degrees. But uh, uh, so the same thing with this virus, having had the virus doesn't mean that you can't get it again. Um, however, what we do know is that um, the vaccination is a great protection over having no, uh, never being exposed to the virus. Um, if, if you're um, if you have not been vaccinated and you've not had the coronavirus, you should certainly be vaccinated. And again, it doesn't prevent you from being exposed or infected. It prevents you from becoming severely ill, hospitalized, and or die. Um, if you've had the coronavirus, it does give you some protection. In fact, you get a higher anti-neutralizing antibody by having, by having been infected than you do by um, the uh, vaccination. However, if you've had, if you've been infected by coronavirus, if you get a vaccination, your uh, level of neutralizing antibody is even higher than two doses of the uh, vaccination. So even if you've had the virus, you are recommended to get vaccinations, okay? Um, so, um, you know, again, it's not that the vaccinations prevent you from getting infected. That's not, that's not the 95% that we're talking about, near 100% that we're talking about. It's talking about severe illness or hospitalization. We don't want anybody to get sick, but having a cold or having some symptoms of the flu uh, for three or four days and you fully recover has, is not, um, you know, it's not that we want you to be ill, but that's an acceptable outcome uh, because it's not long term, it doesn't. It's not a long term dis disability, um, and that's what these vaccinations do. I hope that um, answers the question. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dr. Nickens. We are so honored and privileged to have your expertise here with us today. Next, I would like to, and if if anyone is listening out there, if you have some questions, please continue to type them in the chat box and I will respond and ask the panelists. Um, so next, I'd like to bring on Drs. Peters and Peters. Uh, they are out there on the front line. Uh, they are a married couple that are, are tackling the virus out there every day. Um, I'd like to know from, from you guys, um, uh, Dr. Peters, uh, Rick Peters, uh, and, and Terry Peters are their names. Um, you know, we hear a lot about hesitancy, about um, taking a test and getting the vaccine. How do we empower people to conquer their fears over the vaccine and what some of their their thoughts may be concerning that. Well, you know, I think my main issue is getting to understand where our fears come from. Uh, I have a book called Medical Apartheid. And in Medical Apartheid, it talks about incidents in the medical community that have been done to African-Americans from slavery to today. Uh, so there's much more to the fear other than just Tuskegee and Henrietta Lacks. So we've had plenty of uh, issues and things in our past to have the fear. So I guess the first thing is to acknowledge that we understand why you are fearful. And then start to address the, the fears and, and the issues and the miscommunication and the misinformation that is actually catapulting their fear. And so we start that by first saying also, uh, you need to trust your healthcare professionals. Um, so, 
when you look at these issues where we are on the front line as, as pharmacists and we're hospital pharmacists and with our own pharmacy, we're in the community. So um, even at the hospital, when we didn't, wasn't mandatory for us to take the vaccine, but almost everybody in the hospital had a high rate of compliance, except for the African-Americans. And most of them had fear. They had um, conspiracy theories. And then they also had their own um, issues and experiences where they felt like, you know, I, I just should, I shouldn't do this. So it was even part at that point where we had to focus on um, the fears of our employees and getting them to understand the importance of this situation, the importance of a public health issue that we're in. This is a public health crisis and explain the whole the whole process to them. First by understanding their fears and then by explaining it to them. And some of the uh, key issues uh, start off with, you know, the questions on technology and, and how did they do this so fast and this and that. And I think what I use there and I still use today um, is I was walking down the hallway at the hospital one day and a physician stopped to talk to me and asked me some questions. And we were dialoguing about a patient. And behind her head, I noticed pictures on the wall in, in Heritage Hall of the hospital that I work at a hundred years ago, treating and taking care of people from the pandemic, Spanish flu from 18, 19, in 1820, 1818, 1920. And I decided that later on that day to look up. I said, you know, I wonder, do they have, did they have a vaccine back then? You know, what, what were they going through? And uh, that's where I encountered the, the blessing that we have today. Um, the blessing that we have evolved technologically and medically that what they could not figure out at that time. You know, at that time they figured it was bacterial and virology was in its infancy. So some of the issues that they had were the vaccines that they created were not working because it was bacterial only. And they didn't really create and get a chance to advance into more mm -hmm. concepts and understanding of virology two years later recent years, but again, years later, you know, 1925, 1922, uh, look how many people had died while they were still doing that. And we were able to come up with this technology uh, quickly and save a lot of people. So first is it's explained to them the blessing of the technology. How would they not think that we would be more technology advanced in a hundred years? I mean, right now you get a cell phone, and before you can finish paying on a cell phone, they already have the next generation of the cell phone. The tech, not cell phone technology is not the only people that have made advancements. We have made advancements too. And we have a blessing in front of us. And that's one of the biggest ways that I explain to them is that we have a blessing. I understand your fears, but technologically, these people did not have this 100 years ago. And a lot of people perished. And now in this day and time, I mean, the only thing they had was a uh, mask. Here's a here's a an advertisement, uh, a message featuring a Red Cross nurse of prevention instructions appeared in a U.S. publication in, in the current news in 1918 using a Red Cross nurse to show them how they should focus on protecting themselves wearing masks. That's all they had. Yet we have technology, we have better masks than they had then. We have discovered great things in virology, uh, medications. Uh, also expand with them on the, the concept of, of the technology. Uh, messenger RNA is something our body does already. You know, protein synthesis in our bodies uses messenger RNA. Look how we were able to technologically allow 
biology to bring us to the next generation. So I try to focus on, on the hesitancy by talking about understanding their fears, trusting our healthcare professionals, and letting them understand the blessing of the evolution of uh, medical and biological sciences within 100 years. Thank you, Dr. Peters. And I also have a question from Janelle Welch, who is watching. Uh, either one of you may be able to answer this question. Janelle wants to know, is there a way to boost your immune system besides getting the vaccine? Is vaccination the only solution? Uh, right now, vaccination is a solution. But one of the things, as you can see behind me, we promote prevention. And we have a, a, a whole line, actually, when this virus first came out and we really didn't know what to do, I actually did some research and I was beginning to put together uh, immune boosting protocols, stuff you can buy right from the supermarket. If you, if you um, know of anyone that was in the hospital, the first thing everybody was put on was zinc and vitamin C. So I took zinc to another level. I told everybody, buy coldies, put it in your mouth, let it dissolve. And if it tastes terribly bitter and metallic, your immune system is good. Does that mean you shouldn't wear a mask? Absolutely not. Does that mean you shouldn't get vaccinated? Absolutely not. But I definitely would keep zinc handy during this season because zinc boosts your immunity and you can do without blood work your own simple test to see if your immune system is good by checking your own zinc level, by tasting that um, Coldies has a product uh, and Zycam has a, a gummy. If it tastes terrible, that's a good thing. If it tastes like candy, your immune system is weakened. We also encourage people to do things like uh, 100 grams of um, uh, white capped mushrooms. That has vitamin D and is loaded with trace elements. All these things that you can get nutritionally uh, from your foods and from supplementation to keep your immune system. If you can see behind me, there's a black container. That's um, a, a nitric oxide. The biggest killer of uh, people in the hospital is when their oxygen saturation percents get very, very low. This supplement will actually help keep your oxygen level uh, uh, elevated, particularly good for people who are what we call long haulers, people who have survived COVID and now are suffering these, what we call sequelae, or the after effects of being exposed to COVID, inability to breathe because of maybe some tissue damage because of the pneumonia that they had, or intubation. And one thing I wanna say about intubation, intubation is not putting a mask over your face. Intub intubation is a surgical procedure. They actually have to put tubing that goes down your throat into your esophagus, and actually you have to be um, put in a comatose state in order to receive the medications that will keep you um, from paralytics, they call them paralytics. So you're paralyzed while you're being treated for COVID. Not a good place to be. And people need to understand you're not getting a cold, you're not getting the flu. It's a deadly virus. And whatever you can do to prevent it, wear your mask, wash your hands, uh, take your supplements, stay healthy and get the vaccination. That just be well. Thank you so much, Dr. Peters. Um, and, and we do have others chiming in. Uh, what about vitamin D? A lot of people are taking uh, sea moss. What about that? Are these other things to help to boost your immune system? Yes, they're very, very helpful in boosting your immune system, yes. But they don't replace getting that vaccination. I, I got vaccinated. I took the Pfizer brand twice. I'm in a COVID hospital and I'm very happy to say that neither myself, my husband, my daughter, or any other people that we educated have gotten COVID because they took the precautions. They got the, they take their supplements, but they got vaccinated as well. And they continue to cover their nose. Just so you know, your nose is filthy. There's a lot of nasty things in your sinus cavity. That's why they use your nose to test for COVID. The COVID virus gets into your sinus cavity and grows, okay? And, and once it grows, one sneeze, you can take out a whole room. 
And I say that when I go to the bank all the time, when I'm fussing at people about covering their noses, I say, your noses are filthy. And they found MRSA up there. They'll find COVID up there. And that's how people catch it because it builds up to a certain level. Once it hits a certain level and enters your respiratory system, that's when you are officially infected. So the best way to avoid it is to mask, keep your immune system strong and get the vaccination. I'm going to say it over and over again. And hopefully people will be willing to hear it and go ahead and get the vaccination. And your, your supplementation shouldn't just come from supplementation. It should come from nutrition. Mm -hmm. So the positive uh, thing is, is yes, supplements are great. We definitely, before the vaccine came out, we used our supplements to keep us strong every day before we walked out of the house. Uh, but we also indulged in nutrition habits. One, immune boosting habits. So we're eating foods that are rich in iron and calcium and vitamin D uh, and vitamin C. And we're also not indulging a lot in fast foods and processed foods, um, sweets. sugars, yeah. sweets, which actually uh, um, are attack attack your immune system. Uh, there are no sodas out of there today that doesn't have sugar in it. They all have high fructose corn syrup, which is worse than sugar. So um, also just um, giving your body good nutrition to start, the supplements actually coming in behind that to help boost an immune that, uh, to boost the immune system with that. And then of course, covering with your mask. And that's how we kept ourselves clean and strong until the vaccine came out. Okay, Lolita Watson wants, Watkins is watching and she wants to know Dr. Peters and Peters, what foods specifically? Dark green leafy vegetables. I have a beautiful chart that shows all the metabolic processes. And the one B vitamin, I think everybody should be on B vitamins because they are the fuel that your body needs to uh, build uh, proteins. And you get those from your dark green leaf of uh, vegetables, kale, collard greens, cabbage, broccoli. Uh, we load up on that. That's my breakfast because I'm allergic to eggs. So I actually have a frittata without the egg. So broccoli, you know, dark green leafy vegetables, you will be amazed at how much more energy you'll have when you eat more vegetables, drink more water and eat smaller portions of meat and definitely cut back no sugar at all. Candy, cookies, cakes, every gram of sugar that you ingest depletes your immune system. So you want to eat things that are high in uh, energy producing foods like your, you know, folic acid is very important. So you get those from your dark green leafy vegetables. And it's good for your skin, your hair, your nails, everything. You will be so surprised how much more energy you'll have when you eat those types of foods. You have to get away from the American diet, which the American diet pushes pretty much meat and protein. So, and if you, you can go anywhere, I think the last, I went to, with the Angela also Brooks's <laughs> inauguration party. We had like two hunks of meat, you know what I mean, uh, and a plate full of carbs. And then we had like an ice cream scoop of, of vegetables. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Peters and Peters. Having said all of that, we are still going to have people that are skeptical about getting the vaccine. Um, I would like to listen to the viewers out there who has had the vaccine and that had a bad reaction. Her name is Denise Jenkins. Denise is one of our survivors that thrives. She has survived uh, heart disease, open heart surgery, and she has survived a heart transplant. But when she got the vaccine, things went uh, kind of bad for her. And so I'd like to introduce her to you now and have her talk about a little bit about what she experienced when she did get the vaccine. Denise, welcome. We are so honored that you're here today to join us. Can you tell us what, a little bit about what happened? Hi, thank you, I, um, Florence. I really appreciate being a part of this. 
Um, yes, as you said, I had um, congestive heart failure, which uh, sent me into you know having an LVAD, and then this past December I was blessed with a new heart, um, which was wonderful um, to have that with all within a year. Sad to say, all within 2020, where everybody else was going through the the uh, COVID situation, I was going through my heart situation. But when I was able to get my first shot, which was in, um, I got my new heart in December. First shot I got was uh, March 9th. Um, got the shot. Everything was fine. I got Moderna. Everything was fine during the day. Uh, went to bed that night, but at uh, 1 a.m., my husband found me just shivering. I was just shivering and he didn't know what was wrong. And he tried to wake me. Well, I was actually having a seizure. And, um, was taking to the hospital, actually to two hospitals. Um, the first hospital, my local hospital, and then the other one, which was Anova in Virginia, where I got my heart transplant. Um, looking at my blood work, they were saying that one of my anti-rejection meds probably spiked my temperature, which sent me into a seizure. Um, I was in the hospital for three days, um, actually lost a day in the hospital because I had, I was out of it. Um, but, you know, came out of it fine. There was no damage to my brain. Um, my neurologist said everything still looked good. And I was, you know, fuzzy for uh, about a week or so, um, but came out of it fine. Now, the second dose, I was on seizure medicine. And the seizure medicine kind of kept everything even for me. And, I, and the second dose, I didn't have any reaction to whatsoever. I am now with my uh, transplant team. They want me to get the, of course, the third shot, which um, I will be put back on seizure medicine again for a week and then take the third shot. But I will get the third shot. Um, I am definitely immune compromised. I am one of those people who do when outside and around people have a mask on because I am immune compromised. Um, my kind of issue with people asking the question about why do people have masks on outside, it's like you have no idea what their health condition is. I was a personal trainer um, for 20 years and worked with people with heart disease, worked with people with diabetes, um, knew how they had to struggle with certain health issues. And of course, they never told anybody. They told me. And um, of course, I didn't share with anybody else, but I knew their health condition. So going into a gym where you have people who are coughing, not in their elbow. And, you know, at that time, uh, without masks or anything was, was hazardous to everybody. Um, and we, you know, we did clean and everything. And, and those people who I saw constantly were coughing and sneezing like that. I suggested, you know, how about the elbow or would you like a tissue? Um, because it, like you said, the doctor said this virus spreads quickly, just like the flu. And people don't seem to get that for some reason. Um, so again, I was blessed to go through all I went through in 2020, but then also blessed to be able to have the vaccine and you know survive the seizure, which was not pleasant, but I survived it. And like I said, I will be getting the third shot. Thank you so much, uh, Denise, for sharing your story. Uh, awesome, awesome. So now some people may look at this and, and not knowing her full story may say, well, see, she got the, the vac vaccine and look what happened to her. She ended up in the hospital. Um, any, any of you guys on the panel, I'd appreciate it if you would um, like to interject here and have any feedback concerning uh, Denise's experience with the vaccine. Just unmute yourself. So uh, this is Patrice. Um, uh, Denise, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, you know, uh, so we um, try to pre-identify folks that are at risk for a um, severe reaction, potential reaction to the vaccine. Um, and, um, you know, the 
um, it seems silly to say when we're talking to someone who had a severe reaction, and if your husband had not been astute and um, acted, you know, um, things might not have turned out so well. But um, again, these reactions are treatable. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, we started this session with the real story of a um, person who uh, was healthy and uh, going about her, you know, usual daily activities and uh, was found to be a little short of breath, low oxygen levels, and within seven days, she was gone. And it's, it's balancing these terrible risks of the infection, which can be deadly, um, versus um, the uh, protection against this infection with um, often rate limiting uh, side, um, you know, um, not uh, uh, adverse events that, you know, so we don't want them. We, they're uh, fortunately rare, but they can occur. And um, gosh, with rare, you know, there's, um, again, if, if there's any reason to be concerned that there's a reaction, you know, you can arrange to make sure that you're getting your dose and that you're being observed. You're in a, in a um, hospital um, setting, um, emergency room setting, et cetera, to make sure that you have um, medical access as needed. But um, again, I think not only, um, as we've heard, Denise survived, but she's had her second dose without reaction, taking, sec you know, again, precautions to prevent that same reaction. And um, because of her own risks, we'll have a third dose. So I'm so glad that she shared her story. Um, and so, yes, as people have heard, it's important to acknowledge there are some risks but the, the benefit from boosting your immune response to protect against this virus far outweigh these um, potential side effects. So I would also like to say that uh, I'm very happy that you shared the story with us. <laughs> and the stories are, are needed. First, from what the doctors just said, everything in our field is based on benefit versus risk. Everything, surgeries, prescription medications, everything is based is based on that. Bringing drugs to the market. Uh, I had an interview with the uh, the FDA, and one of the questions they asked me if if the, if we have a a product or a drug on the market that we can bring to the market that we're studying that can save 20,000 people, you know, but 5,000 people may die. Would you approve it? They're going to approve it based on the benefit that we could save 20,000 people. And my answer to them was, yes, I would approve it. But also I would continue post-marketing studies to find out, well, we saved 20. And you said like a thousand people would die what can we do to save those other thousand now let's 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 approve it and then let's continue our research to say hey what is it that caused these 1000 people to have this incident so we can save all of them uh every drug on the market has side effects you watch tv you'll see that you know uh they have one on eczema and and you know uh and the first thing you see is you know uh, fungus uh, uh cancer, you know what I mean? Um, you know, every drug has side effects. Um, everything you ingest has a possibility of having side effects. There are also interactions. Uh, grapefruit can interrupt the absorption of a lot of hypertensive medications so uh, and cholesterol medications. Um, so side effects are there. You can, just because vitamins or even what we call everything natural uh, everything natural, you know, it, it can help us, yes, but in, but taking too much of it can so, cause negative side effects. So our whole existence is based on a balance. I think your team was great to monitor and to think fast at your alternatives and to continue to monitor you and uh, 
definitely look at the, the benefit versus the risk. The actual catching COVID with your profile would have probably been worse mm -hmm. than just catching a side effect and then having the team follow up quickly to resolve that. So we need your story because we do need to know. Remember, this was this was partially studied and then sent out to the market because we saw, and this is not new, during the AIDS virus, people were dying like crazy. And they were like, the only antiviral that was out at that time was killing people faster than the virus. So they marched on Capitol Hill and they marched on governments until they said, look, can you get something out here to help with this virus? And we, and we developed, the medical field developed something and the FDA again uh, released it early so we could start saving lives uh, during the AIDS crisis. And now some of the drugs are actually curative. Right. Now some of the AIDS drugs are curing and, pre and preventing transmission. We, this, we could be on to something because yes. of your case. Your case could have saved people's lives. Now they know if they have a transplant patient who's on immunosuppressive drugs. By the way, people, when you get a transplant, they put you on drugs that purposely reduce your immune system so that you don't reject the transplanted organ. That's the part that needs to be told in this story before people make a judgment against the vaccination. She's already on medications that suppress her immune system. So she has to get the shot because if she gets COVID, she will not survive. She would not have survived. This, this, this fast action of her group, her team, they were phenomenal. That, that, you are very blessed to have an excellent very team. Blessed. I agree with that. Kudos to your team because you didn't have a mild side effect. No. <laughs> Seizure is major. And you lost a day, according to you. So I, I, they stepped it up and they saved your life once by getting that heart. And we're not taking the risk of losing you to a virus where we have a vaccine. So I applaud them as well. Great job. Great job, panelists. Thank you so much, Denise, for sharing your story that needs to be told. Denise continues to have stories that need to be told. Um, and and I'm, I'm glad you chimed in, Dr. Martin, because my next question has to do with the ER. To be honest with you, I was recently in the ER and it was like a zoo. Uh, I took, uh, I went there along with a family member who was ill. It was so crowded. They asked some of us to step outside uh, if we're not see being seen, if you are here accompanying someone, please step outside. There's not enough seats. Uh, and, and she continued to say the ER is full. We have over 100 beds that are full. Every hospital in the area is full. And I felt like, oh, my God, what are people supposed to do? What? It, it made me feel bad for my family member. Do we just go home? What types of things are you seeing in the ER, Dr. Martin? Can you share a little bit about that? Sure, Florence, and thank you um, again for having me here. I literally just left the urgent care um, seeing patients. And what you just described is true. The emergency rooms are packed full of patients, most of them with COVID-type symptoms. And how did we get there? A lot of it is because patients aren't getting or people aren't getting vaccinated. And so we're transmitting this virus at a very high level. Um, some of it's because individuals have symptoms which they ignore or think is just my allergies or I always have a cough. And they're transmitting the virus and have been, you know, because they've been infected themselves. And then we're, the kids are back in school now. So they're back in school in an environment where they're not vaccinated. Um, in some areas of the country, there's no mandate for a mask or for the teachers and staff to be vaccinated. And it's hard to, um, for the children to keep their mask over their noses. So we're seeing a lot of children coming in now that have showed up at school with coughs, and runny noses, and sneezing, et cetera. And we have to also um, impress upon the parents if your child has a symptom at all, 
keep them home from school. Um, some of it's the parents don't know all the symptoms and some of it is they know, but let me just try to slide them in anyway. So it's very um, busy in the emergency department. If you look around the country, there's a shortage of beds. There's a shortage of, a shortage of nurses. So what's the point of having the bed if there's no nurse to take care of the patients? So it's a very um, trying time and we need the public's um, help in combating this virus. If you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. It is working to bring down hospitalizations, bring down illnesses. But unfortunately, you know, this is where we are right now. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Martin, for shedding some light on where you are right now in the hospitals. Um, I was shocked because I hadn't been to the ER in a while. So mm -hmm. I was totally, totally uh, but I uh, witnessed. Um, right Thank now, I, I do have one question. Uh, go ahead, Dr. Martin. But I also, I also want to impress upon those who have medical emergencies, not to hesitate coming because you're afraid of catching COVID. I know so many people who don't come who experiencing potential cardiac events or maybe they have COVID and they're short of breath. I don't know they have COVID, but they do. They're short of breath or whatever, strokes. Um, people are afraid to come in who really, really need to come. So be assured that we take precautions at the hospital so that to keep the transmission down. But if you really need the emergency room, and if you're not sure, call, talk to a nurse or someone and get the treatment you really need. Thank you for making that point. Very, very good stuff. Uh, uh, Dr. Peters, as you were talking about some of the preventive measures and things to do, uh, let's see. We have Alexis Lawson who is listening and she asked the question about a nasal rinse. Is that something to help uh, to, to either cut down the likelihood of catching COVID or help to prevent it? Uh, I would say you have to be careful with that because what you don't want to do is flush the virus into your throat because then it can gain access to your digestive tract, your throat and you know, they have 92 symptoms associated with COVID and one of them is thrush. So you can suddenly get thrush in the mouth and, you know, I don't know that that's a good idea. Rinsing your nose, uh, I would maybe wipe it out rather than use a rinse, especially if you suspect you have COVID, but definitely keep the nose clean. And you can certainly do that with the, you know, just a little Q-tip to clean the area uh, or maybe a, um, uh, I would actually even use Listerine. I mean, you can just clean the area gently, but I wouldn't necessarily rinse, especially if you suspect that you have COVID. You don't want to flush it into your body. You want to get it out, blow your nose, blow it out of the nose, not inhale anything that could go down in your throat. Thank you, Dr. Peters, so much. And uh, so I'd just like to know at this point, if there are no more questions from our viewers, uh, are there any closing final thoughts you'd like to tell the public, people who are trying to do the right thing, people that are hesitant, uh, any, any final closing thoughts at all? Let's start with you, Dr. Nickens. Thank you again. Um, this this uh, this is a contagion. This is a, a, a pandemic that depends on each of us being responsible for ourselves and for each other. It's all of us. Um, vaccination should be the top of your list unless you have some contraindication. Um, and most medical conditions put you at risk you know, that you have even greater need, greater protection from uh, from getting, you know, need to be protected from getting infected. So vaccination is top of the list. Um, the social distancing and masking, et cetera, these are all very useful things, but nothing takes the place of a vaccine. The vaccine offers the possibility of um, return to normal. And so exciting in the near future is that our children five to 12 
will have vaccination available. Um, but again, I want to thank everyone for um, sharing their stories and listening. And, and hopefully, if you haven't been vaccinated, you will. And please take your message of confidence um, and the need for vaccination to your family members and friends. Um, because as I said, it's all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nickens. Uh, Dr. Martin, any final closing thoughts? Um, yes, for those of you who can get vaccinated, like Dr. Nickens has just said, please, please get the vaccine. For those of you who, for whatever reason, are not getting vaccinated, at the very least, mask, social distance, and pay attention to your symptoms. If you have any symptoms of COVID, isolate yourself. Um, don't congregate. Get frequent testing. These are all at our disposal. And if you don't know the symptoms, let me go through them. Fever, cough, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, headache, sore throat, loss of taste and smell, body aches, fatigue, and even allergy symptoms. We can have all of those, one of those, or none of those. That's what makes this so serious. So pay attention to your body and pay attention to the fact that we need to all, like Dr. Nick said, we're all in this together. It's going to take all of us to get through this. Thank you, Dr. Martin. Uh, and uh, Dr. Peters and Peters, any final closing thoughts you'd like to um, to, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, in reference to uh, vaccine hesitancy, uh, stop listening to non-medical professionals. Please. And trust your medical professionals. Uh, there was a sports star that said on TV when they asked him, when are you going to take the virus serious, uh, the COVID serious? He said, when I go to a vaccine series, he said, well, when I get COVID, then I'll worry about the vaccine. Just standing there in front of all those people, uh, pushing out information. Vaccine is not the treatment. You know, um, another uh, uh, celebrity uh, talked about going to, uh, we were like lamb going to the slaughter. And I say, just look at the line at the Chick-fil-A and the McDonald's. Uh, that's going to slaughter right there because you're eating processed food. You don't know what's in it. There's tons of chemicals in it. McDonald's French fries, they can't even produce the same formula in Europe that they do in America, which has 14 different ingredients in it because Europe doesn't allow some of the chemicals that we allow in our food. So you're killing yourself slowly from my own food, eating uh, TBHQ, uh, dimethylpolysiloxane, uh, all of these chemicals every day that are leading you to hypertension diabetes, cholesterol issues, all of that, and killing yourself slowly. Yet we're in a pandemic where something can kill you immediately, and we have something that can protect you from that, and you're going to ask me what's in it. I had someone say to me, uh, if you get the vaccination, uh, you can get small clots in your small artery, your small um, blood vessels, and it can lead to a stroke. I said, if you get COVID, you will have a stroke because it forms clots in the brain. You will have a pulmonary embolism because it forms clots in the lungs. You you could end up with an aortic uh, valve problem because it forms clots there. I said, it's so much so that they test you a D-dimer to see if you have a clotting risk and they put you on heparin and lovinox, which are what's called anticoagulants as pro prophylaxis when you're in the hospital. So between the being paralyzed being on blood thinners, uh, being on fentanyl drip to keep you from pain, keep you on midazolam drip to keep you uh, in a state of paralysis and muscle relaxation. Most people aren't even eating. So you're no, also nutritionally starved. Um, this is not uh, the COVID that you want. And, and also the tube that's stuck down your throat being intubated. It's a surgical procedure. It's not air getting blown into your lungs. It's very serious. And that's the trade-off that you want to get for a vaccination, really? Minor discomfort? Take your immune supplements. Take your, your Tylenol. You know, take get some rest. Drink more water. And that will help. Most people in the emergency room, and Dr. Martin can attest to this, have to immediately go on sodium uh, chloride solution IV because most people come to the emergency room are dehydrated. Drink water. You'll flush most of the waste out from yesterday. 
So just, you know, just things you can do that are common sense things that you don't even think about that can make a huge difference. And don't hesitate, vaccinate. That's the last thing I have to say. Don't hesitate, vaccinate. All right, Dr. Peters and Peters, you brought it home for us. Any final closing thoughts, uh, Denise? Yes. All I can say is all that I went through last year with my heart issues, which I think in a, in a normal time, it was still going to be stressful for me. Um, and talking about the tube and all that, been through that twice. Um, not fun, but the, the risk of me taking that vaccine and possibly having side effects, which I did, was more important for me to take that vaccine than to possibly infect my family, infect um, anybody that I was around. Not that I was around a lot of people after the heart transplant, but it's important. And it's not just for me, it's for my community. It's for all the other people I love in this world. So, you know, you not getting vaccinated is not helping anybody. It's killing people. It's killing people. And all I can say is thank the Lord we have the medical professionals out here who are doing the work and working hard to make sure we are getting what we need and taking care of us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denise. And thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, even Jackie Mims, who had to leave a little bit early, who shared her heart-wrenching story uh, of the loss of her mother due to COVID. And we just thank you. We honor you. We, uh, we're glad you're still here with us, Denise. Thank you to the medical professionals, like you said, that are out there in the trenches, on the front line, doing the hard work, seeing this every day. Uh, Dr. Martin, Dr. Peters and Peters, and Dr. Nickens, who's who's uh, doing the research and out there in the front front line of this, um, trying to make sure that we all get over this hurdle and we all do what we need to do in our part. I've received some messages that this has been very informative, very educational. I hope you this has made a difference to someone to go out there and get vaccinated and do what they need to do. Uh, Alexis says, Dr. Peters, you brought it home. That's Dr. Peters. She's very frank in her in her speech always. So, uh, and, and to each of our doctors on the panel, we thank you so much for your expertise and your time. Tune in again next month. We do this every month, supporting our sisters and supporting our community, actually. So tune in next time. We'll have a different topic uh, next month. But thank you, guys. And thank you uh, out there in Facebook land for watching. And have a good night. Thank you.